Let's talk about duodenal secretions. To put all this in perspective, I just want to outline some anatomy related to this. Right here is the stomach. This is where the hydrochloric acid secretions occur that we talked about with the G cells, gastrin, parietal cells, chief cells, what have you. We talked about those in the previous two videos. Immediately leaving the stomach is going to be the small intestine. The first section of it I have drawn in orange here, and this is the duodenum. So food products that are getting digested, digestion certainly begins in the mouth, continues chemical and mechanical digestion in the stomach, and all those digestive products move on into the small intestine, immediately into the duodenum. So from the stomach into the duodenum. Here we have the pancreas, which we've talked about at length, mainly due to its endocrine function. It releases hormones such as insulin, glucagon, among others. And the endocrine function of the pancreas is located in regions known as the islets of Langerhans. But the pancreas also has exocrine functions that are related to digestion. Right here is a pancreatic duct, which allows for pancreatic secretions to move from the pancreas into the duodenum. So in this presentation right here, I'm going to talk about secretions into the pancreas. And these cells right here could pertain to duodenal cells, so cells lining the duodenum, or they could per pertain to exocrine cells of the pancreas. They're both going to achieve these very achieve the same outcomes. So in this cell we have a number of channels and transporters. So let's just go through this and I will highlight the pumps, cells, and transporters here. So what we're going to do here is first look at water reacting with CO2. And as we all know by now, when water reacts with CO2, it creates carbonic acid and immediately dissociates into bicarbonate and the hydrogen ion. The hydrogen ion will leave the cell. This is the interstitial fluid. This is the blood. And over here is the lumen of the duodenum. I forgot to point that out. So this is the apical surface of the cells, basal surface, interstitial fluid, blood plasma, interstitial fluid, and blood plasma comprise the extracellular fluid. The hydrogen ion created in this reaction is going to move out via the sodium hydrogen antiporter. The hydrogen ion will eventually move into the blood and cause no problems because, as we can recall from the previous video, a ton of bicarbonate moves into the blood, leaving the stomach, creating what's known as the alkaline tide which is going to help buffer this excess, excess hydrogen ion. Then what we get is the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. All of these ions, sodium chloride and potassium, will move into the cell via the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter, otherwise known as the NKCC. From there, we will get by this bicarbonate that was produced in this original equation moving into the lumen of the duodenum. And this is one of the key steps right here because we are trying to create an alkaline lumen. We're trying to create a basic region in the duodenum to protect the duodenum of any potential acidic gastric juices that seep into the duodenum from the stomach. Remember, the pH of the stomach can be as low as 0.8, and that is necessary for the conversion of pepsinogen into pepsin to help break down proteins. But we don't want that those acidic juices in the duodenum. So by pumping in the bicarbonate into this lumen, that's going to help neutralize the lumen of the duodenum. Chloride comes in. This is, once again, the chloride shift. 
from here, that chloride proceeds to move back out into the lumen of the duodenum, as does this chloride that came in via the NKCC. So this chloride moves out. So we now have a bunch of anions moving into the lumen of the duodenum. The sodium that came in is going to be pumped out via the sodium potassium pump. And full disclosure, the potassium that comes in here is going to leak back out via potassium leakage channels. I'm not too concerned about those at this point. And then extracellular fluid sodium is going to move into the lumen of the duodenum, not via the transcellular pathway. Transcellular means across the cell, such as these entities are moving across the cell, but it's moving via the paracellular pathway. We have a cell here, we have a cell here. It's moving between these cells into the lumen of the duodenum. Sodium is attracted to the lumen of the duodenum because of all of these anions, because of all of these negatively charged ions, specifically chloride ions. So now we have sodium in the lumen, we have chloride in the lumen, we have a huge buildup of ions in the lumen of the duodenum, which is going to attract water via the process of osmosis into the lumen. That water is significantly important because in addition to bicarbonate being secreted into the duodenum, we have a bunch of mucus secretions secreted in the duodenum to help protect and line the cells of the duodenum from any potential gastric secretions. That come. The water allows for the mucus to be nice and slippery and fluid so it can move along. If there is no water, then the mucus becomes very stagnant and can harbor bacteria and lead to infections. So this channel right here, which I was remiss to mention, is the CFTR channel, which stands for the Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator. For our purposes, CFTR is good. Cystic, fibro cystic fibrosis channel is sufficient as well. But in the absence of this channel, which happens with individuals with cystic fibrosis, once again, we get this stagnant mucus because if this channel is not here, we don't get chloride moving into the lumen. If we don't get chloride moving into the lumen, we don't get sodium moving into the lumen because sodium wants to go where that negative charge is. And if we don't have the buildup of all of those solutes or ions, there's no incentive for water to move into the lumen. So the absence of the CFTR channel is dramatically important. That is the production of the alkaline duodenum and the fluid mucus.